On Yom Kippur, we read the book of Yonah, and I think most of us have a very clear idea of this book's connection to this holiday. This is a story of Ninveh's tshuva and Hashem's mercy, which is what we're all praying for. But most of the book actually focuses on Yonah, who is reluctant to execute this task and so finds himself running away from this responsibility. It's difficult to relate to Yonah, and we wonder, why does he have such a hard time helping these people? And does he really believe that he can run away from Hashem? Seeking a different angle to his story, I would like to challenge the way we think of Yonah and maybe give new meaning to why we read this book on Yom Kippur. As people, as educators, we know the importance of rules and boundaries. Establishing and enforcing laws and regulations are in fact the building blocks of any community and society, be it a family, a school, or a nation. Having said that, we also recognize the importance of flexibility, compassion, forgiving, and at times even encouraging the breaking of rules. I would like to turn our attention to one of the most fascinating texts in the, in the Tanakh that is as enigmatic as it is familiar, Yud Gimel Midot, the 13 attributes of Hashem, which we repeat numerous times in Davani. The, they are first mentioned in Exodus chapter 34, Moshe requested to know God, to understand his ways, and so Hashem explains to him the basic duality of his actions, Midat Adin ve Midat Rachamim, judgment and mercy. ויעבור השם על פניו ויקרא, השם השם, אל רחום וחנון, ערך אפיים, ורב חסד ואמת, נוצר חסד לאלפים, נושא עוון ופשע וחטאה. ונקה לא ינקה, פוקד עוון אבות על בנים ועל בני בנים, על שילשים ועל ריבעים. The Lord, the Lord, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet, he does not remit all punishment, but visits the iniquity of parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generations. The Yudgim and Midot are later quoted or referred to in a few more places in the Tanakh, but unlike Moshe, other speakers usually omit Midat Adin, the attributes of judgment. For example, in Tehilim, Chanun v'Rachum Hashem, Erech Apayim v'Gdal Chasid. Also in Davani, we say the attributes without the Din, which is especially striking because the Pasuk from Exodus is literally cut in the middle, turning venake lo yenake from din to rachamim. While the pasuk stresses that at times Hashem will not cleanse us from our sins, rather punish the next generations due to our present actions, in davening we say just venake as an attribute of mercy. Of course when we daven we stress the rachamim because we're examining ourselves, namely our sins, and so we pray that Hashem will grant us forgiveness. But do we really expect Hashem to always act with mercy? Would we like to live in a world where laws and boundaries are constantly being broken, even if it's for the right reasons? When Yonah explains to Hashem why he ran away from his mission, he says, I know that you are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, renouncing punishment. Like we do in Shul, Yonah too quotes the Yudim and Midot, and he too focuses on Midat al-Hamim but not in a positive way. Yonah expresses through this his criticism of Hashem's actions. He sees mercy as problematic and prefers dying rather than cooperating with this. Why does Yonah feel so strongly about this? Yonah ben Amitai is a man of emet, truth, and he can't accept this shift in Hashem's treatment of Ninveh. If they sin, they should be punished. At first, we might feel distant from Yonah's harsh approach and his clear alienation from the people around him. But in fact, we too tend to expect a strong correlation between human actions and their reward or punishment. Perhaps Yonah represents our attitude when it comes to injustice in the world. This touches upon one of the most basic philosophical questions of human existence. Why do the righteous suffer and why do the evil prosper? Why don't we see an exact parallel between people's deeds and their fate? It seems so unfair. Maybe this is the reason Chazal chose this book as the Haftarah of Mincha on Yom Kippur. They are giving this voice, our voice, a place in our examination of the process of tshuva. At the same time, it seems Sefer Yonah is challenging this mindset. Hashem is signaling to Yonah that justice is important, but building a society is not only based on what's right and just, midat adin, but also on midat rachamim. Not as a compromise, but by definition, we must aspire to be merciful, even when the other side does not deserve it. Perhaps this goes against our intuition, when we think of society in a broader context, we might see this flexibility as a threat to stability. Though when it comes to our own mistakes and sins, we do turn to Hashem for mercy and beg for forgiveness. Not because we deserve it, but precisely because we don't. 
Mercy does not contradict, Hashem, contradict Hashem's power and justice, nor is it a sign of weakness. Rather, it is precisely the reflection of Hashem's godliness. He encompasses both types of action in the world. Just as he can express his discontent when it comes to sinners, he is not hesitant when it comes to being merciful. And so we too should not be. This is extremely difficult to act on. Some of us might look at the world more from a deen standpoint and some from a more rachamim one. Be it in regard to social issues or interpersonal relationships, perhaps in some situations one approach seems more appropriate than the other. But for all of us, as individuals and as a community, it can truly be a challenge to embrace both Deen and Rachamim and attempt to strike a balance between the two. Shana Tabat.